<clears throat> All right. Oh, let me see if I can. Here. <clears throat> okay, here we go. That'll get everyone on. Okay, here we go. Cool. All right. Let's... Hello. Hi, Avalon. How are you? How are you? Doing well. Glad you were able to make it on. Thank <laughs> with you the technical so much. Difficulties. Me, I apologize. Let me come off from the Discord. You you cut out Avalon. What are you saying? Are you able to hear me now, Brandon? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. I apologize. I was in a Discord group. And they were talking and I had answered the call and the call, um, you know, and the, so I do thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's no problem. I definitely understand. Derwin, let me know that you're you're having to switch switch things up. So as yes. long as you can, as long as you can hear what we're doing and everything's working good, then, then we're good to go. So. All right, Brandon. So when I hang up from you, I should see a call coming through. What should I see next? Uh, you should see uh, the call will ring back through just like it did the first time. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye. <clears throat> okay, let's see if we can call one more time. And then we'll get going. Apologize for the technical difficulties, everyone. We can get Avalon back on. Then we'll get things going. Okay. Hi. Hi, Avalon. Is everything good now? Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank Hi. you so much. No problem at all. Let's go ahead and we will uh, get things going and we'll start off with a quick word of prayer and get a quick review in of, of last week. So let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us, even though we don't deserve it. We ask that as we dive into your word tonight, Father, that you would lead us with your Holy Spirit to what you've authored, to the things that you've written through Isaiah, Lord, that we can better understand who you are, that we can better understand the plan that's before us, and Lord, that we can learn to be better disciples and better servants. Lord, help us to find a deeper understanding of who you are, Lord, a deeper understanding of what your plan entails and how we can be a part of that if we'd be willing to listen and glorify you in our lives. Mm -hmm. Lord, mold each one of our hearts into a servant's heart. Help us to see the people that are around us in our lives, that are our neighbors, the same way that you see them. Lord, those who are hungry for your truth, those who are hungry for an interaction with you because they're hopeless, because they're lost, and because they, they're broken. Lord, you've done amazing things in each one of our lives, Lord, and you've transformed our lives into who we are. You've grown us and matured us through your word and through study and through counseling, Lord. We, we ask that you would turn us into an example and a testimony for others. Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to speak the things that maybe not everybody wants to hear, but that those that need to hear it need to hear. Father, we glorify you for the freedom to be able to sit down, read your word, not have to worry about persecution, Father. That our lives aren't, aren't at stake for owning and having your Bible in our possession. Help us to not waste the time that we do have. Kindle a, kindle a fire of urgency to seek after your wisdom, to be in your word, to find counsel through prayer and to be closer with you, Lord. We know that your promises have told us that you'll be faithful to, on your end if we're faithful on ours, so help us to do that. 
when we trip and when we fall, help us to get up quick. Help us to repent and turn from our ways. So that we can be used by you for the things that you've laid before us. Be with us tonight. Anoint this time of fellowship, Father. Help us to, to glorify you more every day in our walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> I mentioned in the beginning, um, I think I got like a cold or something. It may just be super allergies because I did a bunch of yard work and a bunch of work in my garage over the weekend. So if I'm sniffling and sneezing and coughing, and I do apologize, but I didn't want to um, um, skip out just because I got a little bit of a sniffle going on. So let's see here. Can you hear me, Brandon? Yeah, I can hear you, Evelyn. Can you mute me, please? Because for some reason, I don't know how I'm showing up on this call, but it is not allowing me to mute anything. Okay, that's Are you fine. able to mute me? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yep, I will do that right Thank now. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Okay, so I got you muted, Avalon. So if you need to say anything, I don't know if you can find the unmute button through the Skype interface. Um, but you should be able you should be able to find the Skype um, app and then open it up and it should show you that you're on the call. So we won't try to spend too much time troubleshooting as long as you can hear. We should be okay. Okay. Um all right, so we're in Isaiah. Um, we're in chapter nine this week. Um, we were in chapter eight last week. So those of you who were on last week, you have your notes in front of you. What are a couple of the things that we talked about in Isaiah chapter eight? What was God telling Isaiah and what was he telling uh, the people? Oh, fear God and not man. Yes. That was one of the big takeaways, right? Towards the middle of the chapter, God through Isaiah says, don't be like the people. Don't don't say everything's a conspiracy. Don't focus on everything that's not my word and my prophecy, because one, I've told you and I've given you my promises that it's going to be fine. So two, don't be fearful and worry about all the things that are going on that aren't going to be successful anyways. Right. That's exactly what we see going on um, today in, in America and in Western Christianity. Um, and thanks to social media. Fear is propagated just as quickly through the church as it is through the world, right? So you've got people who claim to be Christians who talk about everything but the gospel, everything but their testimony, everything but the, the wisdom of God. And then they'll sprinkle Bible verses in here and there and try to push a woke narrative or push a conspiracy narrative. And they're not doing anything to glorify God. They're not doing anything to make disciples, so on and so forth. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's, yeah, Sandy, thank you. That's probably the biggest takeaway um, I, I usually take from chapter eight. Um, you know, there's a couple of other high points. We looked at verses one through four of chapter eight that Jehovah gives a prophecy of a son to come for Isaiah. And so Isaiah gathers a couple of witnesses and they record what was foretold, um, you know, being able to say, OK, God told Isaiah beforehand that his son, uh, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, was going to be coming. And so he says, OK, cool, um, Uriah and Zechariah. Uh, let's go ahead and sign. You guys notarize the fact that God told me this was going to happen. And then we see in the next couple of verses that it does end up coming to pass. And we know his his name, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, means make haste to plunder, hurry to the spoil. The faster they're pursuing after the spoil, the quicker they're going to be laid to waste. Right. That's kind of what we see in the message of Isaiah's son. In, or I guess I should say Isaiah's, Isaiah's son's name. Um, in verses 5 through 10. God tells the people that the alliances of men will not come against what God's will is for the people. Right. That's why leading into verses 11, 12 and 13, it's so important to contextualize why Isaiah is chastising them because God has given them a promise. It's the same thing we saw with Gideon. It's the same thing we saw through Samson. It's the same th thing we saw in the pattern through judges when we were in there about God said he would deliver them because he was with them. They just had to be faithful to what he called them to do, right? Same principle applies for us today. If we know what God's promises are, we can trust in them because of who made the promise, not because we made it work or we figured it out or we, you know, we were able to do anything about it. Our job is to do what God has called us to do. Okay, so in Amen. verses 11, yes, yeah, so in verses 11 <clears throat> through 13, it says, God spoke to Isaiah with a strong hand. Basically, it's like, Pay attention to the word I'm about to tell you, right? This is something that's very important. Be watching, be paying attention. And then what he goes on to tell him is, um, 
He taught me against walking in the way of this people saying, do not say a conspiracy to everything which this people says a conspiracy and do not fear its fear and do not dread. Sanctify Jehovah of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Right. So what he's telling them is don't be like these people. Don't get caught up in the cycle of conspiracy and do not fear what the people are scared of. God promised the people the enemy's plans wouldn't work. And so they should trust in what he says. And that's the continued issue with people who are following the Lord is their faith. Right. God says, I'm going to deliver you into the hand. I'm going to deliver the enemies into your hand. And then they struggle because it's like, well, what if he doesn't? Right. And we we're guilty of that, too. We're not just looking back from a pedestal saying, oh, well, we you know, I never had that problem because that's an issue we all face. God says, hey, go and do this or I'm going to do this or this is going to happen. And you're like, yeah, well, what if it doesn't, though? Right. That's like our flesh. The impulse of our flesh is to immediately doubt and to have have uh, uncertainty when God tells us that something is going to happen. And that can also apply to the promises in God's word. When God says, I'm going to send my son back and he's going to establish a kingdom. And you've got all these Christians like, well, he never, he didn't really mean that, or we don't actually believe what he said, right? And they turn it into something else and they explain it away and they move the goalposts and they turn it into something that God said, you know, God never actually said he would do. And so you've got a lot of Christians who have shifted their faith into an excuse for the Lord, as opposed to placing it into the faith of what God has actually promised. And that's all, all the promises. God said he'd take care of us. God said he'd provide for us. God said he'd He'd watch out for us. He said he'd direct us. He'd lead us. He'd do. He'd remove our enemies when he calls us to go and do things. He would get things out of the way. And he would, you know, when he calls us to a ministry or when he calls us to go and do something, that he would be the one that's going to make it successful. The question is, do we believe that that's the case? Right? And if we don't, we have to work on our faith. And so we're, we need to spend more time in the word. We need to spend more time in prayer looking for counsel from God. <clears throat> and when we do those things, then it's easier to see, okay, I know the character of who, who God is and, and the things that he's promised. I see him continually coming through on his promises for others. And then we start to see him come through for promises for us. And it becomes easier and easier to do the harder and harder things because we have a track record that's been built with God. But if we're like the world, if we're like, you know, um, America, I, I would, it's not necessarily just American Christians, but America is probably the most guilty of it, where Christians are just focused on everything but the gospel especially the woke narrative with everything going on today in America, where it's a conspiracy this, it's government that, it's political this, it's vaccine this, it's COVID that, and it's all about everything but Jesus, right? So we need to focus on the things God told us to because it's the same thing he's telling the people of Israel through Isaiah. Everybody's worried, right? Everybody in Jerusalem, everybody in Israel, they're worried about the Assyrians, they're worried about this, the, the Egyptians, they're worried about these alliances between men who have said, we're going to come in and we're going to destroy you. And God says, well, no, because I said you won't, it's not going to happen. And the people are still focused on it, right? They forgot the God who they, who they forgot who the God they serve is. They forgot who Jehovah is and they don't trust in him and they don't rely on him. So they have to, you know, so God through Isaiah is like, okay, let's get you refocused. Um, when we, and we actually looked last week at a couple of different verses when God says through Isaiah, in chapter 41, that I will be with you and I will strengthen you. When he says in Isaiah chapter 43 that the river, the rivers won't overwhelm you, the rivers won't overwhelm you, the fire's not going to burn you. When you see Matthew 28, where God, when Jesus says, "I will be with you always," when you see Philippians 4:19, when God says, "I will supply you with every need," then do we live like we believe that? That's the question. And that should be um, that should be something that we look at each and every day in our own walk. Do I walk and believe what God has said is true is true? Because we'll know. And that's the thing. This isn't like, okay, raise your hand and answer me. But be objective of your own behavior. Do you worry about uh, whether or not God's going to provide for you when things get rough? When you see news that there could be famines and food shortages, do, do you just stress about that and focus on that? Or do you remember, uh, well, God said he'd take care of me. Right, because um, because we saw in the previous chapter, in chapter seven, where God says, "If you're not going to believe, then you won't be established." Right, our faith and trust in Him allows Him to be able to prove who He is and prove that He is faithful to those promises. Go ahead, Leslie. I think I might have to end the call because I'm having technical issues on my end. 
Um, so I might like log off and come back on. But yeah, absolutely what you're saying because um, Victor came over today to look at the car for Audrey and I, and that uh-huh. car is like it's it's gone to heaven. It's done. That um, I was getting really stressed out and depressed and sad because I'm like, we are stuck here and I'm like dependent on people for a ride. And like, we want a car, but it's just, it's hard. So I was getting down, but I was like, no, you know, God can bring people to help us like go to where we need to go. Or maybe one day we'll get a car. So I was getting down, but then I got to remind myself, like, if he wants a car for me, it will come like a new car. I'm not saying new, like a used car, of course, but like new to us. So I was in my feelings um, earlier, a little bit, a while ago with Audrey, and uh, I don't know, today was like really stressful, and then I'll, and then last week was hard because I had a freak accident, <laughs> and I fell out of the sh- shower, but I didn't get a concussion or anything, or like hit my head, and then Audrey had a freak accident, like a couple of days later, she got hit in the eye, and it was like, I don't know, weird stuff was going on over here, but luckily, like I was on the floor just praising God, saying thank you, God, like the way I felt, because it was like slow motion, I knew it could have been a lot worse, I was on the floor just saying thank you, because the way it happened, I was like, yeah, I could have really, I could be in the ER right now, so I was just so thankful, I'm still kind of, you know, sore on my arm, but I try to get the journal done tonight, and make it look as nice as I could, I rushed it, I'll admit, I didn't have any pages done, so hopefully you guys like it, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna get off, and I'll I'll be right back, so that's my little testimony, that I just gotta be patient, and trust him, and get out of my feelings, okay, bye. There you go. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> it was well put, right? Get out of your feelings. We let a lot of times we'll uh, we'll let our impulses and our emotions get the best of us and determine how we behave when it comes to obedience to the Lord. And it needs to be the other way around. When Paul says discipline yourselves, right, to run the race, <clears throat> he's saying be, develop biblical habits so that when your emotions and your impulses try to get to you, there you can push them to the side, and you, it's not going to determine whether or not you're obedient to God, right? And that can be being patient. You know, in something that you're struggling with because God said he would provide. And instead of you trying to figure it out and fix it immediately, maybe you're patient and you let him do it and it takes longer and it's a little more painful in waiting and maybe you're a little less comfortable. But then God has the ability to glorify himself by um, your patience and your trust in that he said he would take care of you and he knows what your needs are. Right. And I think a lot of Christians struggle with that. And it's not something that we're ever really going to be completely over. So if we have good habits of keeping ourselves in check, always understanding what God's promises are, those issues will be less and less, and hopefully the damage control will be greater. We're not going to be making huge impulsive decisions that can lead to years of financial problems or issues or or trouble because we weren't willing to trust and wait because God said he'd do it, and we wanted it done immediately, and he took too long, right? So we need to, we always need to be patient. We always need to be waiting on him, and we need to know his promises. We don't know his promises and we don't know his character, then we're going to be trying to do it on our own. And we're just going to try to loop him in when we think it's too big for us to handle. And it needs to be the other way around where everything big and small needs to go to him and he'll guide and direct it and glorify himself through that. All right. So all of that to be said, 11, 12 and 13 should be highlighted in chapter eight. You should remember that. And don't get caught up in the cycle of what Christians are doing today through social media and through their self-appointed ministries. And, talking about everything but the gospel in order to become woke, right? Trying to illuminate the darkness of the conspiracies going on and the behaviors of the evil men, and then forget to share the thing that's going to give people eternal life, right? The actual truth of Christ, the gospel that he shared, the testimony that he's developed in your life. And that's a humongous issue for a lot of Christians today because they feel like it's something God's called them to do. Now, not, you know, I think that as a Christian, the more wisdom that you seek, the more God is going to illuminate to you the wicked things and the things going on that man are doing. Um, That's my train of thought. There we go. Uh, The things, the evil things that are going on, right? It's you, you'll know them. I think that as a Christian, the more you mature and develop, the more you, you see an understanding that God's going to develop in your life. You will understand and be and you will the kind of the, the curtain will be peeled back on the evil and the wickedness that's in the you know the governments and the people that are um, kind of in power over the world. That's that's fine. But you 100 percent can turn that into an idol and turn it into a distraction. OK, if that's the only thing that you you spend your time doing and it's not about becoming a master of God's word, knowing his promises and living them out, then it's then it's just an idol. It's just a, it's just a distraction. And it's just another way Satan has tried to make people feel good about the things they're doing that are not for God. Okay. Now, uh, verses 14 and 15, we see this image of Jesus. 
Um, he should be for a sanctuary, a stone of stumbling, a rock of falling to the house of Israel, a trap and a snare for the ones living in Jerusalem. Many of them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. We looked at 1 Peter 2, 8, Romans 9, 33, Matthew 21, 42, where this image in the New Testament is that Jesus is a stone of stumbling. Okay, He's going to be an issue for those who don't love the truth. And in this case, it was the Pharisees first, the house of Israel. They rejected Christ first. And then we see that there's the nations that also, you know, the Gentiles, the gospel being provided to the nations. Um, he's a stone of stumbling for those who are hungry for eternal life and salvation, but don't love the truth. They're going to get caught up on Jesus and they're going to reject the gift because of who Jesus is. And that's what we see taking place. So Isaiah is prophesying that this there's a person that's going to be standing in this place in the future that's going to be. And we we determined that 14 and 15 were talking about Jesus because in 16 we we opened up and we looked at the prophecy that Isaiah is giving of the canon of the New Testament. Right. We looked a little bit about uh, Second Peter in 1, 16 through 21, the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, John and James, where they see the Lord. In his glory, they see Elijah and Moses, or the image of Elijah and Moses. And those represent um, the things leading up to Jesus's ministry and ultimately what we'll see in the kingdom. Um, and and, Paul, and Peter was basically saying, this is my, this is my um, authentication for my position to be able to give you, and he says, the prophecy more confirmed. So he's saying, I experienced this. This is something that qualifies me to be able to canonize the writings, to be able to put the letters together from Paul and to hand these to John so that John can get everything uh, put together while he's on the Isle of Patmos writing Revelation. So when the Catholic Church and when these other bodies say, well, the councils that were held through the Catholic Church, that's who gave you the Bible, we can say, no, this was prophesied by Isaiah, that it would be that the, the, the law and the testimony of who Christ is would be sealed by his disciples, by those who had firsthand account of who Christ was. And so we dove a little bit into that. But I love 16 because I, I discovered that recently. It was only over the last couple of years when it, we were doing some of the studies on the canon that my dad was doing that I came across that that Bible verse. And it just is like there's these hidden nuggets in Scripture where you've got answers to questions that you've had for a really long time. And just as you're studying through, God just like connects the dots. And you're like, oh, man, that makes sense. And so I will always remember 816 because it's one of the very few areas that are kind of explicit as to the authority of the the apostles and disciples to write and canonize God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us the Bible that we have today. So when people attack whether or not the Bible is valid, we can know that God is the one who authored it and not a bunch of men who are sitting in a council voting on whether or not we should put books in the Bible. Okay, God authored his word. God inspired his word. The God that we serve is not forgetful. He is not relying on mankind to do his will, and he's definitely not relying on our ability to put his word and order in together. Okay, He will preserve it. I see this through so many people, the Mormons, the, the, the Muslims, anybody that has their, their, their the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have their own writings because they think that the original writings were corrupted. Right, That's their principle for founding uh, on a completely demonic religion that they're following after. Okay. The God of the Bible is not subject to what we do. And we've talked about his sovereignty through the last couple of uh, books that we've been in. Um, evil evil happens because he allows it. When things happen, it's because God has allowed those things to happen. So he's not going to be uh, got by humankind. We're not going to be able to thwart his effort to put his word out there and get it to his people. Okay? He is the one who is ultimately in charge. He has preserved his word. So when people tell you, you need to go and study other books, from the Apocrypha, from the Book of Enoch, from the Book of Giants, from the Book of Moses. And they say, well, God forgot them. Or, or because of the councils, they weren't included. You can say, no, God had his hand in this through his apostles. Everything was sealed up and done by John. They had access to those books, and they weren't included because God didn't want them included. So don't look to other areas to find the truth about God until you've searched the Bible backwards and forwards. And if you actually do that, you're never going to be complete. So you'll never get to a point where you're like, oh, well, I've read and studied too much of the Bible, so now I got to go find something else to look at. Might as well go browse through the book of Enoch and see if I can find some more truth. Right? If we're honest and we're diligent in our search for truth and understanding, every time we go into the Word, whether we've read it a hundred times or a thousand, God can illuminate something new. And He will do that if we're diligent. Okay? So never, never get distracted. Don't let people try to convince you with good sounding arguments that they found exclusive truths from the Lord in extra biblical books. That's not how God works. Everything we've been given, according to Timothy, everything we've been given is, is what we need for teaching and reproof and 
and uh, exhortation for the body. Okay. Now, in verse uh, 19 and 20, we see people looking to everything but God, and then we see that our standard is God's word first, kind of uh, um, tacking on to the point that I had just made. Um, what does he say? Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no dawn to them, right? If the things that the, the teachers or the prophets are talking about, the people that are supposed to be influencing your belief, if they don't correlate and line up to the Old Testament and the New Testament in its entirety, then what this is saying, that there's no light in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not led by God. They haven't been appointed to be a teacher by God. He's not using them, right? He's He might be using them in spite of them, but he's not working through them as them actively being obedient. And so that's kind of a, an indicator as, as uh, believers is when we're looking at people who are trying to tell us what the Bible says and doesn't say, um, are they contradicting scripture? I mean, if we go back to the Old Testament in the law, the prophets, if they got any um, any of their prophecies wrong, that was it for them. They only got one chance, right? And that's the standard we should hold to people who claim to be influencers of our of our faith and of our walk. I see a lot of Christians today, and I'm guilty of this myself, um, where they're like, okay, I'm a new believer. And because I've heard and I need to watch out for false teachers, I'm just going to do my best to try and aggregate a bunch of people that I think are good teachers, and I'm just going to pick the truth out from all of the things they tell me. I know they're going to get some stuff wrong, but I think I'll be okay. I should be I should be a pretty good filter to be able to figure it out. But then they never read their Bible. So how good of a filter can you be if you don't know what's actually in the Bible to be able to filter out things that are not actually biblical? You, you can't do it. Right? And so... As a Christian, our first focus, because that's what the promises of the Bible tell us, we've been given the Holy Spirit as New Testament believers, and the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Okay? He will use other people. He will use teachers. He will use people in their testimonies. He will use um, you know, elders in the church to be able to teach and help to exhort and help to find understanding. But the first place that we need to be anchored is the Bible. And that is the way that we're filtering everything that we believe about this life, about the truth of who Jesus is and who God is. Because if we don't, we run the risk of not being able to pick out the things that are not true. And that's happened over the last 2,000 years since Jesus left. Time in and time out. Heresy started creeping in in the first century, and it's had 2,000 years to become a well-developed and thought-out argument that looks like it fits in Scripture but is not biblical. And people accept it because they don't know the Bible themselves. And so we're rampant in the New, New Testament church today. In, in Western Christianity with all of these heresies about hell, about the character of who God is, about Jesus' sonship to the Father, about what eternal uh, eternal salvation looks like, whether or not you can backslide. There's like literally every big point of the pillar of your faith. The churches today are teaching the opposite. And when you look at scripture, you have to go and unlearn those things and try to, you know, um, hopefully filter all of that stuff that you've already learned out. But you have to be willing to unlearn that. And that is something that's hard to do because discipleship, uh, living a holy and righteous set apart life. That's not something that's taught in churches today. So a lot of times people get tripped up at the first sign of, of, well, this sounds good. And then they just camp there and then they develop it. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, when someone presents them with the truth, their argument is, well, I've believed this since I was a kid. There's no way I could be wrong. Or, you know, other people have told me this and they've believed in this for hundreds of years. There's no way they could be wrong. Right. But at the end of the day, Isaiah says, if it doesn't line up with the law and the testimony, there's no light in those people. Don't follow them. Don't listen to them. Don't emulate them. Everything you need is in the Bible. Seek the Bible first. God will lead you to places where you'll you'll be able to expound and learn on the truth. If you're hungry for his if you're hungry for his word, he's going to give it to you. Okay. Chapter eight. Any questions on chapter eight or anything that we covered last week? Everybody having issues? I've seen a bunch of people hopping on and off as we've been going through here. Is everybody here okay? Anybody have a connection issues or are we just maybe? I can hear you. All right. Lauren's good at least. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, Sean's I'm, good. I'm not having any problems. And it's exciting, bro. I'm finally able to listen. And all the way through, no, no hiccups. 
Well, as long as you can hear me, Sean, because I it sounds like you're like I can't hear you super great. Like you your connection's not solid. You know what, can you? Can you hear me <laughs> no. or no? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was pretty rough there for a second. This is this is retarded, bro. Are you sure you can't hear me, bro? Are we in special? I can need? I can hear you now. Yeah, you're good now. I think it's probably just uh, is, this, a is, this, issue. Is, is this the special needs Bible study version tonight, or what's going on, bro? No, no, it's just you know technical difficulties are going to happen if they can. It's going to because my nickname go. is Special Needs Sean. I just want you to know I need a little extra patience and 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 you know care. I, unlimited patience from this end, <laughs> so you'll be fine. I appreciate. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see what we can do about chapter nine. Very popular section of scripture. We see a prophecy about Christ, um, something that a lot of people will reference because it's a very clear cut image of Jesus. But it's giving us an, a kind of a perspective of a physical kingdom. And this is one of the reasons we have to. I mean, we need to cut the Hebrews some slack when it comes to them not seeing Jesus fulfilling uh, the Messiah role. I mean. They had a kind of an embarrassment of riches, but there's a certain perspective you can take in Scripture where, and we've touched we've touched on this in Zechariah and and when we were looking at some of the end time stuff, um, the way that it's outlined and written can be confusing because you would think that Jesus needs to come back as a servant and as a conquering king all at once because of the way that things are written. However, we know that that's not the case as New Testament believers. So. We can't just always be beating them down and brow beating them and say, well, you guys just you know, absolutely didn't get it. Like, it's a little confusing. And you, you can kind of understand that when you take a little bit of empathy. I mean, at the end of the day, there's no excuse, right? God says that they should have known better. However, they're still people. They still have their shortcomings and they still have their fallings. And so, you know, I don't want anybody to misinterpret this as, you know, some sort of an anti-Semitic Bible group because we say, well, the Hebrews never got it. and they're They're blind and they're missing it because God tells us that he's done that because of the way that they've behaved. And we are just as easily susceptible to that type of behavior if we become prideful and we become arrogant of something that God gave to us that is a free gift, right? So we just need to keep ourselves in check. Um, in verse one of chapter nine, we see a prophecy. Uh, starts off and says that, yet there shall, be, there shall not be gloom for which anguish is to her as in the former time when he degraded the land of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali. So afterwards he will glorify the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So there's a prophecy. There's not always going to be gloom and anguish to the places of Zebulon and Naphtali in the former time. Afterwards, he's going to glorify the way of the sea beyond the Jordan to the Galilee of nations. So I learned this. Uh, I'll tell you, I learned this one as I was putting the notes together today. I, it's one of those things that you never pay attention to. But the very region where the Assyrian armies brought darkness and death would be the first to rejoice in the light brought by the preaching of Christ. Thousands of years later, I guess it would be hundreds of years later. Uh, these remote provinces are signaled or signaled out for special mention because they were the first to be depopulated by Tilgath Pilzer in 2 Kings 15:29, and those parts of the land, therefore, on which the reproach of foreign dominion will have been in control the longest when deliverance comes. Basically, what he is saying is these sections, Naphtali and Zebulon, have been in under bondage the longest because they were the first ones to be captured, but I haven't forgotten about them. They're going to be one of the, they're going to be the first ones that are going to hear about the glory of the, the Messiah when he comes. How do we know that that's the first place that Jesus is when he when he starts his ministry? We look to the New Testament. I don't know if any of you have a commentary or anything, but what what uh, what section of Matthew is referencing Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2? Does anybody know? Uh, Matthew chapter 4, 13 through 16. Well, that's what I got in mind. Yep, that's exactly correct. And that's exactly where we're going to go and read. Let's go. Oh, I just ruined that. Go the old-fashioned way. Matthew chapter 4, verses. I'm going to read 12 through 17. The section of this is called Jesus Begins His Ministry. But Jesus, hearing that John was delivered up, he withdrew into Galilee, and having left Nazareth, having come, he lived in Capernaum, beside the sea, in the districts of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that might be fulfilled that spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people sitting in darkness saw a great light, and to those sitting in the region in shadow of death, 
light sprang up to them. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. So all the way back in the time of Isaiah, right? These places, because of the behavior of, of Israel, they've gone into the, under the control of Israel's enemies. They're in bondage, right? Because of their sin and their disobedience and misbehavior. And God says, don't worry, even you who are on the outskirts of the land, I haven't forgotten you. And in fact, the light of the nations is actually going to come to you first. So there's going to become a time where it's not dark and gloomy, but you're going to rejoice and it's going to be glorified in this place because of who I am sending. And then he goes on to talk about in 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, this future Messiah that's going to be the one that ends up coming um, to the nations. Okay. Now, I want to make a, I want to make a comment in the Hebrew. In the scrolls, chapter 9, verse 1 is part of chapter 8. And chapter 9 actually starts in verse 2. And it makes more sense when you read it because one, verse 1 to verse 2, completely different topics. Right? 2 through 7 are basically a future prophecy looking forward to a Messiah. And 1 doesn't fit in the context. But when you read 8, Read the ending of eight. It says, and they shall look to the land and behold trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they are driven to darkness. Yet there shall be gloom for which anguish is history. So basically, when you read the end of eight and into nine one, it makes more sense to contextualize verse one with eight because that's technically where it breaks. So in the English, we we run into this a lot. I've had the conversations about the transfiguration and the, and the future coming of the kingdom when Jesus says, you know, some of you today will be here when you see the coming of the kingdom, and then the chapter ends. And then it immediately goes into the, the story of the transfiguration with James, John, and um, uh, Peter at the mount seeing Jesus. They have a hard time because of a chapter break. They think that it's two separate events, but in the original writing, it's still continuing in from the, the section before. So it's not like going to make or break your, your understanding of the prophecy of Jesus and Isaiah. But if you can contextualize it a little bit further, it makes a little bit more sense to realize that the chapter breaks and verses aren't always accurate when it comes to the English translations. Okay, it's something we need to understand it. So this is one of those spots. So chapter nine technically should start in verse two, and verse two through seven is where we see this this sudden change in style to like this animated poetry where they're like joyful and they're a little bit more rapturous than the kind of the doom and gloom of verse one in, in the end of chapter eight. Okay, so this again is a future prophecy. So starting in verse two, we'll read through to seven. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. The ones who dwell in the land in the shadow of death, light has shone on them. You have not multiplied the nations. You have not increased the joy. Change that. That should say in the Hebrew, you have multiplied the nation and you have multiplied the joy. Um, a lot of the English translations insert not into that when they shouldn't. So it should read in verse three, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased the joy. They rejoice before you as in the joy of a harvest as men shout when they divide the plunder. For you have broken his burdensome yoke and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his taskmaster as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampler is with shaking, and coat rolled in blood shall be burning fuel for the fire. For a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government is on his shoulder, and his name is called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is no end to the increase of his government and the peace of the throne of David, and on his kingdom to order it and to sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now and forever, the zeal of Jehovah of hosts will do this. Obviously a big prophecy, hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. Very, very clear outline of what Jesus is going to do when he came the first time, as well as when he comes to establish the kingdom. In verse 3, we see that the people will see a great light. Okay, So he's talking in verse 1 at the end of chapter 8. It's, it's gloomy, it's dark because of the evil and the wicked, and this light is going to shine forth, and it's going to be a great light. And the ones who dwell in the land, the light will shine on them. Who's the light? We know who it is, right? It's Jesus. We see in Scripture, John 8, 12, Jesus is what? The light of the world. In John 12, 46, Jesus says, I've come as a light to the world so that they won't remain in darkness. Right? And we see this theme all throughout Scripture. Sin, you know, is, is illuminated by the light. Right? We should be the light just as Jesus was the light to shine into the, to the lives of the people who live in darkness. The world is in darkness. So there's this light and dark um, wordplay that they have throughout the Bible. Jesus is represented as the light. So when you see verse 2, we know that the people who were in Israel, where Jesus actually came and was born, they got to see Jesus first, and they're the ones who this light has, has shown on in verse 2. And then we see in verse 4 that this person, right, this future vision of this, this man to come, this Messiah to come, 
This is describing his behavior and the things that he's going to do. You have broken his burdensome yoke and the staff of his shoulder. What does Jesus tell us about yoke and bondage? What happens when we become Christians? We are yoked together. We get. With him. Go ahead, Lauren. We're yoked together with him. Right, the yoke that we carry, the bondage that we had, we've been freed from. Leslie, were you going to say something? Uh, no, exactly what both of you said. I'm done. Right, and so we're freed from our yoke. We're freed from that bondage of sin, of disobedience, of brokenness, of living in the world without hope. Right, and because of this broken, burdened, burdensome yoke and the staff that's on our shoulder, the rod of the taskmaster, the slave master over the world, Satan. Right, his his rod has been broken, and then in verse three, looking back, they're rejoicing, right, as in the joy of harvest, as when men shout when they divide the plunder because they've defeated the enemy. Right, they're now splitting all of the plunder in victory. They're happy, right? It's kind of like it's like the high that you get when you you know you're on top of the world. And it's because of that. Now, he, he references in verse 4, this is in the day of Midian. When did, I, well, I mean, who who freed the uh, Israelites from the hand of the Midianites? We just read about it in Judges. Gideon. It was Gideon, right? And we, if you look in Judges chapter 6 and ju in chapter 7, the Midianites came in and did what? They burned up all their food. They made them slaves, right? They got rid of all the resources. And so God raised up Midian and said, hey, I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the Midianites. And then God did with just a couple of people compared to the, the, the countless army of the Midianites in the land. And there's great rejoicing because of what God has done. And so not just in the context of the physical salvation that God brings, but also that Jesus is going to be the light and he's going to bring a spiritual salvation. Right. We can look back as, as New Testament believers and see that the burdensome yoke and the staff of the shoulder and the rod of the taskmaster are all representations of sin and bondage and Satan. Right now, God's also going to be um, delivering them um, from salvation, the Israelites from salvation physically as well in the end times when um, uh, the nations come against Jerusalem and there's going to be some destruction from the Antichrist towards those people. He's also going to bring salvation then. And Jesus is going to be the one to come back and bring that salvation. So it's like when you look back from a New Testament perspective through Jesus, you can see kind of both of the the, the visits in, in one section. And if you're a Hebrew reading this, it's hard to see past just the physical. Right. Jesus didn't come back and he didn't relieve the yoke of the of the Roman oppression. Right. He didn't. Uh, he didn't get rid of the taskmaster in the in the Caesars. Um, as as uh, Gideon did in the in the day of Midian, right? So they can say, well, Jesus wasn't our Messiah because he didn't bring us the the political revolution. He didn't bring us the physical kingdom, right? And that's you know, I mean, he didn't. He came first as the as the lamb led to slaughter, and he's going to return as the king, uh, the lion, the tribe of Judah that they're they're expecting. But because of their blindness, they're unable to see kind of both sides of the coin. Does that make sense? We can see it as New Testament believers because we have the Holy Spirit. We're discerning. We can see what Jesus told us, and we believe him to be true. But, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of the Hebrews, it's easy to say, okay, well, he didn't do the physical part, so we're going to reject him as our Messiah. Now, that's not to justify their rejection of the Messiah. It's just to try to say, it's a, you know, they're not 1,000% blind because it is a little bit difficult to discern some of the things written about in the prophecies in the Old Testament and the prophets, right? And so... We're just making the case, right? We're saying it's it's it can be a little bit difficult, and that's why it's so important that we need the Holy Spirit. And that goes back to the point that my dad continually makes on Sundays and in his 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 Bible studies that he does throughout the week. Just because someone is Hebrew doesn't mean we can trust them on or uh, trust them as an authority on what the Old Testament says, especially if we're trying to figure out what it means. Okay, that's just how it works. Um, we continue on into verse six and seven. Actually, hold on real quick. Let's keep going. We've got verse five. We've got to review first. It says, every boot of the trampler is with shaking and a coat rolled in blood shall be burning fuel for the fire. Um, this is a describing a future period of victory. So the, every boot of the trampler is going to be shaking and the, colts, the coat rolled in blood will be used as fuel for a fire and burned up. We see this described in Ezekiel 39 verse 9. When it's talking about, and those living in the cities of Israel shall go out and shall set fire and burn the weapons, and they shall burn them seven years. So we're seeing, again, a, a kind of a context of the kingdom, because we're doing that through the book of Isaiah. Before the kingdom is established, there's going to be a period of time where there's a victory over the enemies. 
that have come against Israel. They're going to be saved from the yoke that's been placed on them by the rod of the taskmaster. They're, that burdensome yoke is going to be taken off, just like they were given salvation in Midian. And then leading into the kingdom, there's going to be the, the supplies of our enemies are going to be burned as fuel for fire. And Ezekiel contextualizes that, that that fire, that's going to go for the first seven years of the kingdom because of how many enemies and all of the different things that are going to be laid waste and left over after Jesus delivers salvation and brings a victory um, against Israel's enemies. Okay, so we're, we're starting to kind of build a broader picture of what's going to happen before the kingdom. There's going to be a victory. <clears throat> And there's going to be a fire as a result of that, and they're going to burn up the, the supplies of the people that Jesus uh, brings down. So verse 4 and 5 is bringing of the salvation. And then in 6 and 7, we see Jesus very clearly. Um, I don't necessarily think we have to go too deep into that because it's a very popular section of Scripture. But I want to, I want to look real quick. The increase of authority and for uh, peace without end. Uh, it says in verse 7, there is no end to the increase of his government and to the peace on the throne. What it is saying... Um, is that during his reign, right, the reign of this coming child that's going to be born, that's going to be counselor, um, his government is not going to end. The government that he establishes, the kingdom, is not going to end. Now, uh, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, tells us that at a certain point in time, he's going to give his authority back to the Father, but the kingdom is going to continue on, and the new Jerusalem will be brought down to the earth. Okay, but that kingdom, once Jesus establishes it, it says he's going to sustain it with justice and righteousness. Okay, so he's going to be the one that's responsible for making sure that it's good to go. It says right before that in verse 7 that he's going to order it. So he's not. So when people try to tell you today that Jesus needs us to clean the earth up so he can come back and inherit it, look to verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 9 where it says he's going to be the one that orders it. He's going to establish the rulers and leaders. He's going to be the one to clean out the wicked. He's going to be the one to maintain justice and righteousness. There's a lot of bad theology that's floating out around there about the kingdom that tells us we as Christians, through the Holy Spirit, have to rid the world of wickedness before Jesus will come back. We have to get the kingdom ready for him. That's something the Jehovah's Witnesses think about as well. We have to get the kingdom ready, and then once it's ready, then Jesus will come back. Right? We're already in some sort of a some sort of a kingdom or through the uh, the Holy Spirit, we're ruling and reigning with him on the throne in heaven, right? And that's not what scripture tells us. It says that when Jesus comes back, he's in charge. He's in charge of cleaning things up. He's in charge of bringing God's wrath. He's in charge of structuring the government globally. So he'll be putting people in charge over cities and nations and states, and, and he'll be the one giving job duties to people that are working in those governments. He'll be the one to oversee all of that, and he'll be the one to maintain the peace through the justice and righteousness of his authority. And basically what he's doing is he's establishing Jehovah's standard for a kingdom, right? To have a righteous king, to have a, a king who's just, who's not impartial, who's not corruptible. Okay. So nine, seven is a really good section for the kingdom because we're, it's not ambiguous. God didn't say, okay, cool. I want my, my Christians. I want you guys to go ahead and get rid of the wickedness, go ahead and establish your school systems and your government, and then when everything's hunky-dory, then I'll send Jesus back because it'll be in the all clear. No, we can't do that, and if you'll notice, things are continually getting worse, and there's not, there's not any hint that things are getting better based on the things that the Christians are doing. It's going to have to be Jesus that comes back to do it, and that's exactly what Scripture tells us is he will be back, he will do it. Okay? Um, we continue on. It changes tone. So verses 8 through 21 we now see a future prophecy. We're going to break this down a little bit, but it's basically judgment that's going to come on to arrogance and oppression. Directed at Israel, right? Jacob, it says in verse 8, Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it has fallen into Israel. And all the people shall know, Ephraim and the ones living in Samaria, who say in pride and greatness of heart, bricks have fallen, but we will build with cut stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will use cedars instead. So what's going on? is the Lord is bringing destruction to the people. He's bringing bondage. He's bringing the enemies to surround Israel. And we see right through Isaiah and through the other prophets that he's doing this because of their behavior. Okay. Their response in turn is prideful. And in verse 10, oh, our walls have been brought down. That's fine. We'll use choice stones to rebuild it. Oh, our sycamores have been you know, toppled over. That's fine. We'll go and find cedars to build it up instead. 
So their response to God's attempt to get their attention and get them focused back to him, kind of turn them back to him, is rejection of what he's been doing. They're not paying attention, and they're responding with their own will in their own pride. Right? It says in verse 9, who say in pride and greatness of heart, they're puffed up. They think that they've got it under control. They don't need God, and that's exactly how they're behaving. Right? Now, here's the question. We name, we turn that into a New Testament 20, you know, uh, Gregorian year 2021 biblical concept to take away and live by. If God is trying to get our attention and things are failing in our life, do we pay attention and say, God, what are you trying to do? Or do we say, no, that's fine. Things have fallen apart. But I'll just build back better. I'm just going to get myself, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm going to go and establish myself or I'm going to make myself successful or I'm going to build myself a career or I'm going to make a ministry for God. Right? What if you start a ministry? You don't ask God. You just say, I want to do this for God. Right? God says, well, one, you're not ready. And two, I never called you to do that. And you say, nope, I really feel like I'm led to do this because my pastor said I got a talent for it. So then you establish a ministry and then you go out there and it miserably fails. Right? Some people see success. Some miserably fail. Right? And God does it because he says, I don't want you to miss, miss the point of what I want you to be doing in your life. I want to counsel you. I want to grow you. I want to be the one to prepare you. And you say, nope, I'm a self-made man. And you take that solemn responsibility from God. And now all of a sudden it's your will. And now it's about you. And you say, well, this, this ministry failed. I just need to try harder. And I need to focus on the way that somebody else did it so I can see success and I can make it a great thing. Oh, it's for God. I don't care what he says. I don't care what his direction is. I don't care if he's involved, but it's for God. Right? Is that our behavior? Did we pick the things that we're doing or was it something that God laid before us and we're trying to be obedient and follow it? That's not to say that we can't volunteer our time in areas that need help. That's not to say that we can't get involved in areas that need help as well. Okay? That's, you know, because God tells us we need to be involved and help the body. However, if you think that you're the one that's in charge of what you get to do, then you're going to run the risk of behaving in the same way that the Israelites are behaving here with God. Where they say, nope, I got it under control. I don't need God. Things may have fallen apart, but it's fine. I've got good resources. I paid money for a class on how to do this, right? I paid $2,000 to go through a ministry class. I think I can get this figured out. I'll let you know if I need any help, God. I'll see you later. Right? Because that's, that's essential what's going on here. Right. God established their cities. God built them up. God protected them. God brought them down. And they said, no, nope, we got it. We'll just rebuild stronger. We don't need God. And that's exactly what you're looking at. So that's the behavior of the arrogance and the oppression that's going to start off to the things he's going to talk about and the depravity and the wickedness that's going to happen. But the way that we can look at this as a New Testament believer is, do I do things because I want to please God and because he's told me to? Or do I do things because I want to bring success to the table and show my value? based on my determination, based on what I think I should be doing, based on what other people have told me they think that I should do, not because God told me, not because I recognize God's hand in things, okay? Because that's two different behaviors and that describes two different relationships with God. One is in good standing and the other one is not. So hopefully we're being objective of our behavior and the things that we're doing and that we're offering up to the Lord. And it's not to say that, you know, if we try to take the initiative and go and do stuff, God's going to be mad, right? I think it's kind of a continual issue in, in, you know, especially in Israel's life. But we can see this behavior in other people who call themselves Christians. I've seen this behavior in people who call themselves pastors, right? And I'm sure you guys have seen this behavior in people who are in leadership or, you know, have these, these self-appointed roles within a church structure. And it's about them. It's not about God. It's about their ability. It's not about obedience to God. It's about, you know, their glory and their pride and their kingdom. And it has nothing to do with what God has called them to do. So at the end of the day, we just need to make sure that we are approaching God in the things that we, you know, we think he wants us to do with meekness and being willing to be corrected and redirected. Like if you can learn to do that, God can do so much through you that you're not going to be tied down to just like this narrow column of, well, this is my only thing that I can do for God because there's a multitude of different gifts and there's a multitude of different things you can be doing for the Lord. And if he can trust you with those, then he'll call you to do more than just a couple of things. It's like the same relationship that you have, whether it's with a kid or with a new coworker that's coming into your job. The more that they can familiarize themselves and show themselves trustworthy with a little bit of responsibility, the more that you can delegate to them, even when it comes to some of the bigger things. So make sure that you are a teachable servant. Make sure that you have a meek heart. 
and make sure that you're listening for direction and that you're obedient when God calls you to do. And then he will outline and direct you in the things he wants to see succeed in your, in your life. Okay. So take that as you will. Just be objective of your behavior, right? Check your attitude before God. Now we keep going. Um, ignoring what God has done to them to turn them back to him, blinded by pride in their actions. We keep going verse to verse 13. We'll see exactly that. In verse 11, it says, And Jehovah will set up resins, foes against him, and weave together his enemies, Syrians in front and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with all of them out. And in all his anger does not turn away, but his hand is still stretched out. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them. They do not seek Jehovah of hosts. Same issue that we continually saw through Judges. They did not seek God until they were not wanting to deal with the, the results of their behavior. Right? And in this case, it's gotten to the point they're not even turning to God. Like at least in Judges, right? They were they were still pretty close to God's working through their, their fathers and their grandfathers, where they're like, okay, cool. We're doing bad, but at least we know we can run to God. Now we look at Ahaz in chapter seven and we look at the arrogance of the people in Israel. They're not even thinking they need to turn to God. They're just like, well, this is terrible. We're gonna come back better. Not man, look at this oppression. Let's go back to the Lord. And even still, God through Isaiah is saying, I'm going to preserve you, right? Even though Ahaz isn't willing to place his trust in God, God says the, the plans of your enemies, the Assyrians and the Egyptians, it's not going to succeed. I'm still going to keep my hand on you. Don't worry about what's going on. And it, like this is a, an un, almost, um, it's a hard to grasp level of, of grace and mercy that God's showing to the people who don't deserve it. Israel does not deserve God's mercy and grace, but he is continuing to do so because of his promises that he has made. Okay? So the thing is, let's not abuse the grace that he's showing to us because how many times are we in a position where it's like, man, I should not have done that because I sh knew better five years ago. And I've made the same mistake up to a thousand times. God is still showing me grace. All right? That's the God that we serve. Everybody always focuses on the negative. Right? It's all the time. Oh, man, the God of the Old Testament, he's so mean. He's so angry. He's just killing everybody. He's got a bloodlust. And then you realize, or that you, you know, you tell them, oh, well, you're, you know, you're defending people who are eating their children and sacrificing them to gods, who are committing bestiality, right? You really want to be on their side, saying that God's mean and angry. Not only that, he gave them hundreds of years, right? 490 years, where he said, okay, cool, I'll be patient. <clears throat> Obviously, you're not going to get it, so time's up. Right, contextualizing God's behavior with the actual behavior of the people that He was He was bringing destruction to, um, it makes things a little bit more, uh, I guess, a little bit less complicated when you see exactly what the people were doing. Because we're going to talk about it when we get to the end of this chapter. He says specifically, uh, the people were eating the flesh of their own descendants. They were committing cannibalism because of their wickedness and idolatry. So, yeah, it may be a little bit harsh, but God gave them more than enough chances, more than enough time. Right, and so that's what we need to contextualize this with. It says in verse 14, <clears throat> And Jehovah will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and brush, in one day. The elder and the exalted of face, he is the head, and the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. So he says in one day he's going to cut them off completely, and then he identifies them in verse 15 as the elder and the exalted of face. They're the ones that are the head that he's going to cut off, and the prophet who teaches lies, he's the tail who's going to be cut off. So we have to try to better understand this. Who, who, if you were to guess, who would you say the elder and the exalted of face are? Not necessarily a specific title, but who in the in the society of Israel, who would those people be? Who would those people be today in the church? Sanhedrins. Yeah, you could say the Sanhedrins. Yeah, the people who have age, right? They've got tenure because they've been in service of God, you know, in air quotes, for a certain amount of time. Um, that that would lead into the next question. Who in the modern church could be considered the elders and the exalted of face? I mean, you could just say the elders that are in the church. <laughs> That's kind of cheating because that's what it says in Isaiah. That's exactly it. Okay. That's right. The, the elders in the church. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> elders in the church. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> um, the people who are in self appointed positions who are not following God, but are leading the people away from God. Right. 
You see that argument all the time. I've been in ministry for 50 years, so you need to listen to what I say. Not, I have the Holy Spirit and God's prepared me and he's put me in this position and has made me successful. It's, look at who I am, right? These these exalted of face, the ones who are, are, are more um, concerned with their status in the society than they are with their standing with God, right? So their their tenure and their position. So those are the ones that are ahead. Okay, we see them in the in the church today, and pastors who will always kind of lean on their God given authority, quote unquote, right? They'll say, "Oh, you can't test God's mantle on the authority of the chosen, and you have to submit to me because of who I am and my position, my leadership." And at the end of the day, it's all about them, right? Same behavior that Israel is showing to the Lord. It's about who they are. It's about their will. It's about their glory. And then you have on the other side the prophet who teaches lies. He is the tail. Okay. That one's pretty straightforward. Prophet who teaches lies. We see the same, the false teachers of today who teach lies. But the tail illustration I thought was really interesting because the false prophets, try to put this in your head. Try to try to imagine this. I'll try to help you as best I can to paint the picture. But the false teachers and the false prophets are generally following in the areas that they, they pretend to be leading in. And what I mean by that is... There's a couple of examples in the Old Testament, but false prophets were frequently guilty of following where they pretended to leave. And man appropriately described and can be appropriately described as the tail. What I mean by that is the best example that I can think of is when you describe a good leader versus a boss. Right. And just your workplace, right? Places that you've worked, jobs you've worked before. If you've ever had a good leader, they're with you. They're working with you. They're developing you. They're actually doing the things that they're asking you to do. And they're, they're, they're leading by an example. But a boss, right? A boss is someone who's going to sit on their desk and they're going to send you into the fight. And they're, you're going to be the one that gets rolled under the bus when things don't go well. And they're not helping you to succeed. And they're not concerned with you, you know, doing things right. And that's what you're seeing here in the difference of someone who is appointed and positioned by God to do God's will versus someone who claims to be someone who's actually following God, right? In 1 Kings, we see in, in chapter 22, 6, Ahab and the false prophets and Micaiah, where he goes and he says, Ahab's looking for a word from the prophets, and he says, if we go up against our enemies, are we going to be okay? And all the false prophets are like, yeah, you go ahead. God's, God's got you, right? They're not going to go ahead of him, but they're sending him out into problems. And Micaiah comes and says, well, no, God's going to destroy you. And Ahab literally says in that story, he says, well, I don't like him because he never says anything good to me. Right, basically verifying the fact that he's following God and the rest of his prophets aren't. And then you see in Ezekiel 13:10, 13, 13, kind of this outward um, condemnation of false prophets. He says in verse uh, 10 of chapter 13 in Ezekiel, because even because they made my people go astray, saying peace, and there was no peace. Right, so the false prophets will send you out into destruction without hesitation, and they're going to follow you there. That's why there's an illustration of them being as the tail and then being cut off by Jehovah. Uh, it's the same behavior inside and outside of the church. That's why literally good leaders and bosses are an excellent example because a good leader will be with you and they'll, they'll lead you. That's exactly what they'll do. And a boss will drive you kind of like a slave master to where you're wanting to go and you'll be dragging them and they'll be the tail end of, of the vehicle that's moving forward. Okay. The reason that I like to make this example is because this happens today. False teachers have no issue sending follows or followers into trouble with confidence. Okay, we could spend the rest of tonight and the next two weeks talking about different groups of people and different uh, uh, Western Christian assemblies who the leaders will send their people into spiritual trouble without issue because they don't know how to lead and they don't actually have a relationship with God. Bethel is an excellent example. You've got grave soaking. You've got these false signs of the Holy Spirit. You've got all these demonic and pagan practices that are in the church, and the leadership is sending their people ignorantly out into those things, and they're fine with it, but it's opening them up to spiritual trouble. Catholic Church, pray to dead saints, pray to dead people, and they wonder why they have all this demonic activity going on in their congregation, because they're, they're leaving their people susceptible to danger to spiritual danger to things that they don't have discernment or understanding of and they're just like yep you'll be fine just go ahead in the name of the lord go do these things and what they do is they find themselves toying with demonic and occultic things 
And then all of a sudden they've got these problems in their life that follow them because they thought that they were doing what God wanted them to do. That's exactly what was going on in ancient Israel when the prophets are like, oh, God's with you. Let's go and do these things. God's with you. Let's participate in pagan practices. God's with you. Let's go ahead and build Asheroth poles and kill your children for the sake of Molech. They're opening themselves up to problems because they're trusting in people who God never said, I'm working through them. There's no fruit that, that that's happening, and that's going on today. The Mormons do the same thing. It's one of the very first things that you do as a Mormon is you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a physical confirmation that your faith is authentic and you're going to experience a burning in the bosom. For those of you who have been in Utah or in Utah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the leaders are sending them out into literally a, a spiritual trap where Good word, Satan, Brandon. Satan Good can word. absolutely... Um, it's not my word, by the way, Sandy. It's the word. We're reading it together. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. It's where Satan is basically keying these people up who are spiritual infants and setting traps, and then he's reeling them in by giving them some sort of a supernatural confirmation. Right? Because he can do that. Satan can answer prayers. Satan can provide you know, some, not, not necessarily the miracles we see through Jesus, but some, some signs and wonders right, through the supernatural. And so that's why it's so dangerous when you've got these false teachers and these false prophets, people who call themselves prophets today, and they're sending these people out to the slaughter, just like we saw in Zechariah, the flock doomed to slaughter because the leaders don't follow God and they're sending them into spiritual destruction. So false leaders don't discern spiritually dangerous behaviors and practices and will send others ahead into danger. This is why we vet our leaders and teachers. So the question I have, is it okay, kind of like what we were talking about before, is it okay to aggregate multiple bad teachers and hope you can pick out the truth? <laughs> Softball that one no. out there. No. no. Thank you. you okay, the and that's, that's what Christians do today. There's so much to read about the Bible. It's so hard because it's in Old English because it's, it's in the King James Version. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know Greek. So I'm going to place my trust in the authorities, you know, the way that the world does. Oh, well. You know, this guy studied Greek forever. He went to a college that didn't believe the Holy Spirit was real, but you can trust him. Right? According to the last chapter, if they don't if they don't uh, teach us something that's that that lines up with the Old Testament and the New Testament, they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. And that sounds pretty harsh. We want to be, you know, we want to kind of be like, okay, um, let's give people a chance. We're not perfect, like this whole, you know, tolerance angle which which feels like a good angle feels like that's okay because i'm not perfect and it's really arrogant of me to dismiss somebody if they get a couple of things wrong right that's you know and that's the angle that people take like i don't want to be prideful it's like a false piety and and to a degree it's, it's probably pretty you know from it's coming from good intentions because that's the way that the world behaves i'm not an expert so i need to trust in the people who say that they're experts well the difference is I have a relationship with the person who authored it so I can be considered in direct contact with the perfect expert. I don't need other people who don't have any relationship with him to try to tell me what it is that he's authored because he said he'd tell me himself. Now, he can do that through other people who have the Holy Spirit. So my job is to be able to discern what somebody's life looks like who does and doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's why we've talked about through Judges and through Isaiah how to discern a false teacher because we need to be able to vet our resources. Is it wrong of me? Is it arrogant of me to say, I've been following this person's ministry and they've I've seen two or three things that are wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the things that they tell me about. I'm going to try to find my resources from someone else. Is that wrong of me? Is that arrogant or is that biblical? Lauren, did you have your hand up? Yes, I wanted to say... That happens in my family, and I get called self-righteous because I don't want to follow the pastors that they talk about. <laughs> well, Lauren, you are self-righteous, but for the rest of us, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, well, Scripture tells us that our, uh, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. And when God tells us all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, there's going to be false teachers. You've got to learn to identify them so that you can protect your faith. If we take that lightly, then we can't be surprised when we're in the same boat as everybody else who doesn't care what they believe. God continually looks for people who are zealous for his truth. It tells us in Titus, zealous for good works. 
That's who Christ is looking to use. People who are willing to cut the fat and draw a hard line and say, if it is not God's word, then I don't want anything to do with it. Would you go as far you, to say it's guarding our heart too? It is 100% guarding your heart, right? Because you're defending it against things that will you know, affect your, your eternal position with the Lord. Because that's how we yeah. need to look at it. If you let bad theology creep in in one place and you don't have the discernment to be able to correct it, Who's to say that you don't have bad theology in the areas that do matter? Because that can affect your relationship with God and ultimately lead you away from the gift that you've been given in salvation. And it grows. It, yeah. You know, it, the bad theology, it grows if you let it have a just an inkling of space. Correct. Right. It's not just stagnant. It's like dealing with right. sin. Right. If you show to God that you're not concerned with what his truth is, then he has no problem allowing you to continue down the path of deception because that's what you've shown that you want. Right. Right. Because it's on us at the end of the day. And so, you know, I don't it's tough because, you know, you get you, you talk about this type of stuff and people are, oh, you're 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 just a bigot. You're closed minded. You're not willing to to listen to all the arguments and you're not willing to be academic about it. And it's like. Who cares if it means that I'm I'm going to be more assured in my salvation and I have a closer walk with God because of it, then cool. I'll give up the world. I'll give up approval from other people. I'll let people think that I'm stupid. I'm going to be honest with you, though. I hear it every day. And sometimes I start, I go to my room and I'm like, okay, <laughs> am I being self-righteous, Lord? Help me. I don't want to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no. And it's a struggle because there's times where I'll deal with that as well, because, um, you know, in my studies, I'll see all of these people who are just, you know, they've got all of this experience and I still fall. I'll still, if I don't catch myself, I'll still fall into it. Like who am I to say whether or not they're, what they're saying is right. 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 And you're like, am I being arrogant about this? But God says, no, you need to guard yourself. And it's not that we're out here saying we know better than everybody else. It's just that we're examining the evidence and we're determining whether or not we can accept it. Well, and that I is not throw arrogant. scripture at them. <laughs> That's you know, what you have don't to do. argue with me. You know, argue with God. That's his word. That's exactly the, the attitude that we have to take because God's word is what people will be accountable to, not what we say or not what the message that we give to him. It's you want to argue, then argue with the evidence, just like I've made my determination by the evidence. I don't right. care if you've been doing what you're doing for 50 years and you're the world's leading expert. If you don't have a relationship with God, as far as I'm concerned, you're not qualified to tell me what he said. Exactly. All right. Thank Leslie? you. Yeah, no, of course. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Leslie. Okay. Uh, sorry. I'm, I'm having like issues with the hand. I was going to say something, but I took it off and then I think it went back on. I don't know. Um, if it messes up again, I'll just like hang up and get back on. Uh, when you were speaking, because tonight I drew uh, bugs, I drew beetles and ladybugs. So I was thinking of this bug. I forgot the name. It was on my Facebook. So I've been trying to find it. And it, I think it's like a caterpillar. I'm not sure. And the cool thing about it is it has um, an imitation head at the tail. So the tail, the head, although it looks real, it's fake. It's not the real thing. And um, it protects its real head like that. But it's an imitation. Like, you got to look really close and study it to see that it's fake. But, I mean, it, if you don't pay attention and look into it, you can be deceived and think it's the real deal. So when you were talking about, like, um, the prophet being the tail and all that, I thought of that bug because it's amazing. If I could just remember the name or get the picture, I would attach it here. But it's a really cool bug because I'm into insects too. So I'm into a lot of things, reptiles and insects. You know, I'm going to draw maybe next week some reptiles. But yeah, so I just thought of that. I don't know where I was going with it, but I wanted to share it. If I, if I find the name in the picture, I will attach it here in this group. Okay, I'm done. Bye. Yeah, yeah. if you can find it, definitely share it. Um, and we've talked about that, the counterfeits, right? The false prophets and the false teachers. This isn't like some binary... The good teachers are are glowing in light and the bad teachers have a cloud of darkness around them. The false ones are counterfeits of the real ones. So they look authentic and they look exactly alike, just kind of like what you described, Leslie. And so that's why we have to look to the fruit and the evidence to make our determination, because it can appear on the outset that the people that we are following or listening to are well, good to go. But if we're paying close attention after a long enough period of time, they'll reveal in their behavior, in their ministry, in their discipleship, in the things that they're talking about, where they're not biblically lined up with God. Because the, we've talked about this before as well. You can find inklings of the truth and recognize that it's the truth without the Holy Spirit. That's why there are there are sects of or, or assemblies of, of false Christianities who have inklings of truth. They have little seeds of truth in the things that they believe. 
because you know even a broken clock is is right twice a day right so that's why we have to go further than just well they were right on this one thing so i'm going to trust everything else it's what did they say? Let's line it up with the Bible. Okay, what else did they say? Okay, let's see if that's in the Bible. Okay, they said something else too. Well, let's see if it lines up with the Bible, right? That's the way we need to approach it. Sean, is your hand up? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I have a question for you. So you know how you know a lot of people have online ministries and they have like all these hundreds of thousands of followers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You notice if you've ever gone on any of their posts, like, you know, I noticed the one recently where I went on and asked the guy if he was following God's calendar or the world's calendar, and he never responded. So to me, when people are silent, that means that they know they're wrong. Am I right? I say in a lot of, in a lot of cases, yeah, they don't want to incriminate themselves with the wrong answer. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to tell you, here's the worst part. I did this early on in my walk, and God kept telling me, Sean, I didn't save you to go win debates and to prove that you're right. I saved your soul to go love people and help point people to Christ. He kept saying, it was like, I just felt him nudging me over and over and over again. But I'm glad that I was able to go into these online, you know, talks and whatever these people, I, I just, I just felt like he gave me discernment early on and I would see things and I'm like, this is discouraging because it's like, I thought when I came to Christ, we were all one big family. We all were going to love each other, but it was the actually to me is the complete opposite, you know, and that's why I told you I stumbled upon, you know, Victor's page and I was praying on, you know, I asked God to send me to a, a biblical, you know, a ministry that's, that basically taught biblical truth. Like you guys do. There's a reason why I'm in this Bible study. There's a reason why you and I are in fellowship and why me and Victor, you know, we, we kind of support each other and what we're doing. And it's, it, to me, I find more satisfaction in that than, all this other stuff that goes on because I, I feel like what we do is more spiritually led and it's and it's more feeding our spirit whereas a lot of these other people they want you to stroke their ego they want you to pat them on the back tell you how amazing they are and then post like all their accolades it's like i don't think jesus hung on a cross so we could post our accolades and how amazing you know like i don't i don't maybe i'm wrong for saying that but i see it too much in in, in the in the body of christ where everybody's talking about how they're so blessed and anointed and i got this and that it's like why like i just feel like that's the flesh am i wrong for saying that no that is right the bible tells us that our glory is in the future right these dirt vessels and the material things we might have that's not our reward right that's not what we get god says jesus will glorify us at his return right yeah. we will be raised we will be raised up we will be transformed into glorified bodies and we will receive our reward and our crown of eternal life. And that is going to be a glory before the entire world that we had found the truth and we were obedient to the Lord. Right. We're not concerned with patting our own back now. Right. A real someone who's concerned with glorifying God. That's exactly what they're going to do in their ministry. And they're going to do their best to try and stay out of the light. Right now, to the, you can't remain anonymous in everything that you do, but. Everything should point to the glory of the Father, and everybody today is about themselves, about their ability. And you know what's interesting is some of those ministries were started by God, where God says, I'm going to place this on their heart. They're they're authentic in their faith, and they'll take off, and they start to see a little bit of success, and they'll grab it from God's hands, and they'll go down a different path, and they'll make it exactly what they want, and then God's not in it after that, right? And that's one of the things that we see where you're like, man. You know, it looks like I've been following them for a while and I, I saw some of their stuff and it looked like they were on fire for God. And as soon as they started to see a little bit of success based on the world standards, God was removed from the picture and it remained about them because they didn't go through preparation. God wasn't the one who trained them and counseled them. He isn't the one through the Holy Spirit who developed their understanding. And it was just about them copying success in the world and tacking God, excuse me, tacking God onto the end of it. Right. The point that I'm making in this Bible verse or in this section here, 14 to 15, it ends with authentic teachers of God will lead you because they're also following God themselves. You know, I think that it's be I think that, you know, like Christianity, Christians, uh, they you know, there's a Christians that want to know about God. And then there's like Christians, it's, you know, that that they know God because they don't want to go to hell. And then the other Christians know God because they've already been there. You know, and that's what makes you hungry to learn from him because you've already been around the park a few times and you tried everything else and you've seen the fake, you know, right. and uh, you, you've made up your mind who you're going to serve. Yep. And then, you know, as we've talked before, God will facilitate your decision. 
right? When you've made that that choice in your heart, God's going to be the one to facilitate it so that you're accountable. God will never, not, he'll never bring someone before his throne of judgment who isn't accountable for the things that they've chosen in their life. Like that's just like, it just doesn't exist. So that's one thing we have to be uh, aware of as Christians in, in our ministries and in what God facilitates and the things he leads before us. Glory is about him. We start to get caught up in us. We need to reel it in. We need to stop what we're doing. We need to be able to have the self-control to be able to say, okay, let's put a pause on this and let me reprioritize what I'm doing so that God can remain number one and I don't run the risk of turning this into myself, right? Turning this into something about me. You That's know, difficult. Um, uh, my relationship with him, I, I fall in love with him more and more every day because in this world, you see so much unfaithfulness. You see so much... Uh, uh, just unfaithfulness, right. you know, yeah. adultery and all those things. And and even in our own lives, you know, the, the the folks that we've had in our lives in the past, that they're hurt and stuff. And you get to the point where, man, you've been there and done that, and you just don't want to do that to Jesus. When you fall in love with him, you just want to be a faithful lover. And you don't want to take your eyes anywhere else because what he's done for you. Because you've been hurt and you know the feeling. Yeah, you've described something that I think um, uh, doesn't necessarily exist in people who haven't had time to mature in their walk because it's an intimate relationship. And the more maturity that you have as a, as a New Testament believer, the more awareness you have of your behavior in relation to, a, to you and Jesus, right? It goes from, I'm a Christian and I, you know, it's kind of like, I've got this sign where I can hold it up and this is who I am in my identity to walking next with next to Christ in your walk and saying, I don't want to do things that are going to hinder my walk with you. Cause I've, I've thought that exact thought in my life before where I was dealing with, with sin. I was dealing with bondage. I was dealing with disobedience. And it got to the point where I was like, I was so sick and tired of what it was doing in my relationship with God that I had to give it up. And at that point, God facilitated the victory and released me from all sorts of addictions and bondage. But I had to make that decision that it was because of that separation in my relationship with God and I didn't like that. I hated that being apart from him and, and that separation. And, and, and you know, you know the difference as a Christian. I don't even feel like I need to articulate it. It's when, you, when you, you're in the presence of the Lord and you do something you know you shouldn't and you stay away from God longer than you know you should. And you start to have that, you know, that guilt and that worry and that, like, I miss what I had. I, I don't care what momentary pleasure I can get. I don't care if I lose everything in the world. I want back what I had right? At any cost. And so you're willing to sacrifice that part of who you are. And that's the process of sanctification. That's the process of being drawn nearer to the Lord. And so, you know, being able to articulate that, you know, it shows some self-awareness, it shows some maturity, but I think a lot of Christians don't get to that point because they get tripped up in their flesh. They get tripped up in their pride. And God says, well, you know, if you love the truth, you're going to continue on and find it. So um, should be encouraging, right? Obviously, I'm not calling anybody out here as far as false teachers or anything goes, but just be careful, right? And that, and this isn't just like, because I could see somebody listening to this and making the argument, oh, well, you're just trying to, you know, aggregate all of your followers so they don't listen to anybody else, right? I'm just trying to hoard you guys and keep you under me. And, you know, it's about me and my ministry and all that. And I could see someone trying to make that argument. But at the end of the day, I've told you guys a hundred times, and I'll tell you again, test everything I say. Don't trust me just because I make an argument sound good or because I can use some Bible verses. Right. Because you have to follow after the Holy Spirit. Now, my job is to hopefully facilitate that and help that growth and to connect those dots so you guys can see that quicker than if you're doing it on your own. But at the end of the day, don't trust me just because you know me and like me. And I know some of you may not like me, <laughs> which would be a good reason to test the things I say. Uh, Leslie, go ahead. You're right. I, like, I prefer Megan. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um uh, what I was going to say is I've been guilty. Uh, so this is confession, Leslie's confession time. Uh, so these last, okay. So the weekend and even into today, I've been very, uh, busy, like, and time management has not been on point that even Audrey came and told me like your time management is terrible. And I almost had a breakdown earlier, like way before Victor came over. Cause I felt like I just did not have enough time in the morning to like study and read. And then Audrey was up earlier than I thought she was going to be. And then I had to help her get ready. Cause she's doing like an interview. And then I was trying to cook and just get ready. And so, I mean, so many things that I was like, this is not good. Cause I'm not having like the, the peace and I'm not um, having the patience. And I realized that from the last three days. 
So um, that was something. And then the Lord has been telling me, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not listening, basically. So I was like, yeah, I, I can see this is a, like, I was frustrated. I was done. I was like, I am so tired of this. Like, if I got to be up at like 6 a.m. with like three hours of sleep, then that's what I got to do because I'm just tired of feeling rushed and not getting that adequate like time into study and whatever. So I really felt that like this weekend, even into today. So I was like, man, when I have the time, like I have more patience, more peace. And when I don't like, this is the mess I'm in. Okay. So that's just my little confession. I just wanted to agree with what you're saying. I'm done. Yeah. Anybody who has, who's ever struggled with time management issues, raise your hand. Uh, Oh, I don't have that option. I was going to raise my hand, but <laughs> I'm just as guilty. <laughs> time management is something you have to continually work on, especially when you're trying to carve out time to spend with the Lord. Um, so don't feel guilty, right? Just uh, just use it as an opportunity to do better and learn, which it sounds like you are. So you're on the right path. Um, okay. So the point for 14 and 15 is kind of your point to remember when God calls you to do something, whether it's directly, whether it's through somebody else's ministry who's led by the Holy Spirit, whether it's through the word. God has promised that he will always be with us. He will go before us and he will facilitate the success. Okay. False teachers will send you out on your own and see if you survive to follow with you. That's the difference. So pay attention to the people that you're listening to. Be willing to draw a hard line. If they are not getting things right in their quote unquote ministry, in their teachings, if you see two or three things that are evidence that they're not right, doesn't matter if they're little or big. You need to be willing to say, if this is going to jeopardize my relationship with the Lord and my understanding of who he is, then I need to be willing to remove it entirely. Okay. That's not to say that there's not good resources. There's tons of resources. God can use, God does not have a shortage of resources in leading us to his wisdom and understanding. But when you're showing him that you value your relationship with him over the convenience of people that you like following, that will pay dividends because you're showing him what that relationship actually means to you. And he will reciprocate. That's what he is looking for. He wants people who are going to be zealous for his truth. That's what that's what Adam and Eve were supposed to be responsible for, was guarding his temple in Eden, and they didn't do it. And then God says, I'm going to pull a people out. They're going to be the Hebrews. I want them to represent and be a light and guard my truth. And they didn't do it. So then he goes to the firstborn of Israel, and he says, I want you to guard and hold my truth. And they didn't do it. So then he goes to the Levites, and then they didn't do it. And then they lose it. And then the authority goes to Jesus so that it can be established and that it will never be lost again. And we get to partake in that through Jesus because of our relationship with him. So we've been given an honor. It's a gift to handle. It's, I've said this before. It is a gift to be given the gospel. It is a gift to be given the understanding and the wisdom and a testimony. And then you are responsible for being a steward of that gift to give to other people. So be trustworthy. Okay. Let's continue because I know we're almost out of time here. Verse 16 is the rescue of the, or uh, sorry, the result of following men and not seeking God himself. So it says in 16, for this people's leaders lead them astray and its guided ones are swallowed up. So everything we just talked about for that reason that they're following after them, those leaders are going to lead them away and the guided ones are going to be swallowed up. Okay, literally just reiterating the points that we just made. Now, verse 17 through 19, we see fiery future judgment against the arrogant, just like we see Jesus is going to bring back. Um, 17, for this, the Lord shall not rejoice over their young men, nor have pity on their orphans and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks foolishness. In all this, his anger does not turn away, but his hand is still stretched out. For wickedness burns like a fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle the thickets of the forest, and they shall all roll upward, like the going up of smoke. The land is scorched by the wrath of Jehovah of hosts, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. So this concept of before the kingdom is established that we talked about earlier in Isaiah, there's going to be a judgment for arrogance and oppression, not just within Israel, right, the immediate context of what Isaiah is talking about, but in the broader context, he says in verse 19 that the land will be scorched by the wrath of Jehovah, and all the peoples will be as the fuel of fire. That's a description of a future event of the future destruction that's going to be coming. Now, verse 20, I want to stop here for just a second. It says, and he shall cut off on the right hand, yet be hungry, and he shall eat on the left, but not be satisfied. Each man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. In most English versions, that says arm. Um, but what that would translate to more, more accurately would be children. Offspring, to be specific. So that would read, each man shall eat the flesh of his own offspring. 
So without going too long, because it's already 9.04, I know we're over, the wickedness and the idolatry that was taking place and the disobedience and the just blatant disregard for who God was and what his standards were led the people to cannibalism of the people's own descendants. They were offering, I mean, we know in other areas of scripture that the Israelites were, you know, they would go through these cycles where they'd find the Lord and then they would turn from him, but they would go further into wickedness each time. So this cycle is continually getting worse and worse in the result. And it's getting to the point where they're eating their own offspring. They're eating their own children as a result of their disobedience and their idolatry that they're partaking in. So when you look at the things that God did, you say, man, God was mean. Are you really trying to be an advocate for the people who are willing to kill their own children and eat them? You really want to be on the argument of the side of the people who are committing bestiality, who are offering their own children up to the gods through the fire? Like, it gets to a certain point where you're going to be as about as wicked and evil as you're going to be, and God says, okay, you've made it to a point where now you're going to see destruction because there's no coming back. Okay? Verse 21 says, but it's hard, or his hand is still stretched out. We see that concept or that little, that little his hand is still stretched out in verse 12, 17, and 21. Since no repentance was forthcoming from the northern kingdom of Israel, the Lord's hand of judgment will continue to be overstretched unrelentingly and will result in their captivity. God didn't just wipe out Israel because they wouldn't listen. That's, a, that's one thing that a lot of people try to make as far as an argument is concerned. Right? The God of the Old Testament was mean. That's why we have the nice God of the New Testament, which is Jesus. He's, he's nice. We like him. But Jesus is going to come and bring the same wrath that was poured out on the people that God did in the Old Testament because of the wickedness and the absolute depravity of the humans who have rejected God, who have not honored him, who don't even recognize who he is or don't even think that he exists. And we're not going to get into the wokeness, right? We're, we're avoiding that based on chapter 8. But if you look at the things that are happening to innocent lives, right? A marker of a, a wicked and perverse people is the things that they're willing to do to the innocent because they know that they're, or they think in their heart that there's no reper, repercussions for their behavior. And they think that there's zero accountability. They're willing to go to the, to the ugliest depths of human behavior against those who are defenseless and innocent. That's children. When you see the things that are going on to children nowadays, you can see the signs of the times, right? Homosexuality, that's one thing. That's perverse, and that's, 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 you know, that's its own issue, right? A lot of the transgenderism, that's very, a lot of people are very confused. When it comes to hurting the, the innocent children, right, the things that, are, that I don't want to go into detail on that are happening to kids today, that is a sign that God's judgment's right, knocking on the door. And Jesus is going to be the one to, to, to pour it out so the world can see who it is. So if we reject him and choose our will, wickedness will be the result. It's that simple. If we don't think God exists, our will is going to lead us to depravity and wickedness. Given enough generations, it's going to get bad. And that's the cycle we see in Scripture. If people are close to God. They step out just a little bit. They kind of tiptoe into disobedience. Then the next cycle, they tiptoe a little bit further. Next cycle, they'll take a step out. Next cycle, they'll walk away. Next cycle, they're going to run away. Next cycle, they're not even going to be close to God. They're, they won't even see him or recognize him, and they're going to be so far into their darkness that it's going to look like a normal day to them. That's America. That's what's going on in, in Asia. That's what's going on in China. That's what's happening in Russia. People who think there is no God, they've been raised for generations to think that they're just a random assortment of atoms and that their existence is meaningless and there is no accountability and there is no transcendent moral order. They don't have a problem doing hideous things to people who are innocent and defenseless. And that's exactly what's going on. And God says, I'm watching. And that's one of the takeaways for today. So let's answer our questions really quick. He did know God, but that's just to, so Leslie says, I really don't understand Solomon with his children. Uh, he knew God. Yes, he, he knew God. But when you choose to walk away and be disobedient to God, like I said, he'll he'll facilitate a hardened heart. And there's no guarantee that you get to keep the understanding and wisdom of who God is in your relationship with him. Right? You run into you run into disobedience and you run into idolatry and sin and you reject God in the process, there's no guarantee that you're going to withhold all of the wisdom that he poured out on who he was. And I think that that's kind of the case. It becomes confusion, it becomes kind of a gray area because to have his holy spirit discern things in your life, when you lose the holy spirit, you lose that ability. Right? I don't really see evidence of people who had been given uh, tons of wisdom, godly biblical wisdom, who will go and choose sinfulness and desire and flesh and then are still a, mo a moral authority for God. 
right? We see instances of scripture where God will turn men's men's minds into mush for the sake of his purpose. So, and that's, you know, that's just, a, that's my two cents, right? That's my, my conjecture. We don't see any scriptures that say that, but, you know, take that as you will. Um, okay, so context of chapter nine, we see prophecy of future Messiah. We see payday for the arrogant. Those are two of the big, pay, the, the big takeaways from chapter nine. The character of God. This is the one that's a little bit more of a harder pill to swallow. I think it, it forces some development and some maturity. God's patience and long suffering towards us will allow us to chase after evil and wicked things. This can and does affect the innocent, and God will hold them to justice and accountability. That's a complaint of a lot of people today. If there is a God, why does he allow so much bad to happen? And you should reverse the question. If God has given us free will, why do we behave so badly? That's a question people aren't willing to ask because they want to assume that they're generally good, not generally evil. Because his arm's still stretched out. <laughs> his arm is, uh, yeah, yeah. Verse 12, 17, and 21, his arm is still stretched out. Amen. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it's it's hard to, to, to grasp. It's like one of those where God would sacrifice our life for the sake of somebody else. It's like, man, that kind of sucks. But in the in the scope of eternity, I could see why he would do that, right? Because he 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 doesn't will that anybody would perish. But that's the unfortunate thing. We will see wickedness. We still we will see evil prevail. It will get worse, and then Jesus will return. So we have but to. That's have the, the joy of it. Return. The judgment is coming to that wickedness. That's exactly part of the hope that we're told in the New Testament that there is a day of reckoning for those that's who have right. continually rejected God. So we yeah. can take hope in that. We can take joy in that, and we can right. look forward to that time. Be that crushed. focus. Right to what Sandy just said. That focus is what's going to sustain us when evil is abound is abounding all around us, and we see things that we could say, "God, why, why are these happening?" And, and that's not people. being unmerciful for the sinner, because you know what, God's not willing that they perish. And we pray for our lost family and our friends. We love them dearly. We don't want them to to taste of that. But you know what, God is a just God, and judgment is coming to that wickedness. And I am glad. I will rejoice on that day when it gets its lunch. Well, think of it kind of from a different perspective. I, I agree with what you say, Sandy. But if we can find peace and joy in this time, imagine how good it will be when all of the evil has gone. We can't. Yeah, that's true. But how is it? How how it's so hard to find peace and joy at this time when our when our family's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that's that's kind of a kind of like the uh, not necessarily an enigma, but the peace and the joy and the the long suffering and the patience that we have now. As a result of the Holy Spirit, that's true. In, that in the midst, right, of the things the that are, that, yep, and the things that can be, we would consider to be sorrowful and sad and depressing. You know, when all of this is done away with, regardless of the result of other people, when wickedness and evil and Satan is bound and all that's done up, just imagine the peace and the safety we're going to live in. Amen. That should that's that in whole, itself should bring us joy and hope, right? Definitely, so, of course. That's what that's what we live for. And that's not to dismiss your point, because that is very true. There are people that we love and that we're close to that we want to see come to know the Lord. And we sometimes we, there's going to be a hard pill to swallow to realize that that may not be the case, because if they reject God in their heart, all we can do is is be a good a good witness, a good testimony, and and fight for the truth. And hopefully, you know, when the tribulation does come, that's enough to shake them out of their their uh, their mood and, and bring them to the Lord, which is really what the tribulation is for. Right. That's hey, pay attention. This is it. So we'll see. Just we just got to remain faithful. Um, OK, so the point for me to take away, always be checking for pride and arrogance. Right. That's always just kind of a good foundational habit for Christians today um, in your behavior, in your walk, you know, spending time in prayer, asking God, God, counsel me, show me where I need to do better. Do I have pride issues? Do I have things I'm not willing to let go of? And he'll show you. OK, um, when he does, don't just kind of walk away and say, OK, cool, thanks you know, work, help, have, allow him to work on those in your life. And then the kingdom question. So we can answer this one now in chapter nine. What can we determine about the coming kingdom from chapter nine? A couple of things. Before it, we'll see the enemies are going to be burned up. We see that in verse five. We're going to see that in the future, a ruler who will sustain justice or justice and righteousness will be established. <laughs> Looking back, excuse me, we know that's Jesus. We see that in verse seven. We see that this person is going to be of the line of David. So we can reasonably assume that the Antichrist who steps up is going to claim to be a descendant of David, right? To some degree or another. 
uh, we see that Jehovah will enable this to happen in verse 7. So it's because of God's zeal or what we could consider jealousy that he is going to be the one to facilitate this to happen. All of this is according to God's will. When Jesus is here in his ministry, he's doing God's will, right? He tells us multiple times, the things I'm telling you, he taught me. The things I'm saying, he said to me, not my will, but your will be done. So it's all at the end of the day, the kingdom that's coming, the ministry that Jesus had, it's all about the will of God the Father because of what he's doing through his people. Okay, And then the last one, the Messiah will order the kingdom in verse 7. It will be Jesus who is responsible for structuring and organizing those who are going to be in authority over the kingdom. We are not responsible for that. And even if we were, we would not be able to do it without the Holy Spirit. But the nice thing is, it's not our responsibility to do that. We just have to make sure we run the race so that we can be part, be a part of it in the future. Okay, we did okay on time. I know we're still over. I do want to open it up. Any questions or comments before we wrap up in prayer? Yes. Can you repeat um, the character again, what you said there? I have part of it. I have patience uh, and long-suffering towards us, and then I don't have the rest. I don't know either. Hold on. Okay, God's character. God's patience and long-suffering towards us will allow us to chase after evil and wicked things. This can and does affect the innocent. God will hold them to justice and accountability. Not the innocent, but the people doing the wicked things towards the innocent. In case you're wondering. God's obviously not going to punish the innocent. Okay. Any questions, comments? Go ahead and close. Yes. Hey. Um, oh, go ahead, Leslie. Oh, for prayers, Harry wants some with Andrea and then some for Audrey and I, please. Of course. Hey. Okay. All right, let's uh let's go into oh next week. Um we'll study Isaiah. And I think we'll do chapter 10. Uh, yeah, we'll do chapter 10. So your homework is chapter 10. Answer your questions, context, character, point for you, uh, to take away, and then what can we learn about the kingdom? And I'm not I didn't go through Isaiah 10 just yet, so I don't know if there is anything on the kingdom, but we'll see. Let's go and pray. Father, we thank you for today. Oh, we thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. That your mercies are renewed every day because we need it. Father, we ask that you would kindle a hunger for your wisdom. That you would drive us or that you would you would bring us along, develop and to be turned into a vessel that can be usable by you. Lord, we ask that you would break us down in our areas that we're weak. That you would shave off the areas that we struggle. We can ultimately step out of the way and glorify you in our lives. For the ministries that you're preparing us for, Lord, for the responsibilities that are down the road. Lord, that even if we aren't 100% confident in our ability, even if we don't know how things are going to turn out, that those things wouldn't stop us from being willing to step out because we know who you are. We know that you don't leave those who are yours hanging. Lord, we ask that you would continue to test us, that you would continue to Bring us through the fire that you would refine us, Lord. That no matter the pain, no matter the cost, that we would be hungry, that we would have a zeal for your truth, Father. Because we know that your message isn't a popular one. We know we need to be prepared to be sent into the world. We know that we need you to do the preparation. We can come to an understanding, Lord. We can come to a resolve. We can come to a conviction of who you are, of what your gospel is, of who your son is. That in the face of everybody saying that we're wrong, we're arrogant, we're mean, judgmental, we're doing it out of the love that you showed to us, Lord, that we could find eternal life. That we could be brought into your service. That we could be trusted with responsibility in the kingdom that's to come. We know the time is drawing near. We know your kingdom's almost here. So we ask that you would help us to see and better understand that kingdom. Help us to develop a full picture and an understanding of what you're going to be doing and what your people will do, of what the nations will do, Lord, so that we can share the same message that Christ brought when he came the first time. To tell people to repent that the kingdom's here. Lord, use us for your glory. Make us smaller. Make us meek. Make us humble. 
shape our hearts. Continue to work on our hearts, Lord, so that we can take your, your perspective. When we see people that are hurting, that are acting violent, that are lashing out, or that we can see from the spiritual perspective of you that they're damaged, they're broken, they need you. We would be able to approach them with peace and kindness and servitude, even in the face of abuse. The same way that your son was a servant, Lord. Give us the courage, the boldness, and the utterance to be able to walk that type of a walk. Or to be able to show that type of a faith. So that we can step out of the way and we can be glorifying you for what you've done and who we are. I lift up Leslie and Audrey. We ask that, Lord, you would be in control of the circumstances in their life. That they could have a peace knowing that you're in control. You've promised in your word in multiple areas that you're going to provide. Lord, help them to, to hold fast to that promise. And then turn it into a testimony when you come through. But give them a physical touch so there's no physical pain that they're suffering with, Lord. That your will would be done, that you could be glorified, that that could be shared with those who are also looking for healing from you. Lord, we lift up Harry and Andrea. You know what's going on in their lives. You know what's going on with Harry. Lord, we ask that you would work your will through both of those circumstances. Just like with everything else, that you would be glorified in their lives and in the lives of those around them to see who you are, better understand the things that you want to do intimately in each one of our lives. That you're not just some God who started things and left. That you're not only interested in what's going on in the nations, but that you want to interject through those who are improbable to do the impossible. Make, make us those people. Be with us this week, Father. Test us. Try us. Give us, op- give us opportunities to be successful and obedient. Tell us when we can be generous. Tell us what to be generous with. Give us the words to speak and share. Most importantly, don't stop working on us, please. Give your praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name.